Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Delik, for agreeing um, uh, to, to present chapter six of this book. It's fantastic to hear, uh, you know, you presenting the judgmental forecasting. Uh, uh, I am sure uh, I will learn a lot myself just from this, uh, this presentation. And, um, and thank you very much for, uh, for contributing to this forecasting book club. Thank you, Bahman, and thank you for your kind invitation. Um, as you probably know, judgmental forecasting is one of the top of my favorite topics to talk about and to research on and so on. So, um, and thank you for this great initiative with the book club as well. I think the field of forecasting owes a lot to you. So great initiative, happy to support. So today, I would like to talk about chapter six, uh, Judgmental Forecast of the Forecasting Principles and Practice book in this forecasting book club. So an overview, uh, the chapter starts by talking about how uh, forecasting using judgment is common in practice. So typically in lots of situations, you may not have any historical data at all. So completely new conditions, completely unique market conditions, all kinds of things are in, in change and we can totally sympathize with that given the COVID now, when you have very unique, uh, previously unencountered conditions. And so you have no relevant data and judgment comes in extremely handy in such situations. And also you may have incomplete data. You may have some partial data, you may have trust issues with the data, but when you have incomplete data, then uh, practitioners uh, typically favor using uh, forecasting with judgment. Now, accuracy of judgmental forecasting improves when the forecaster who is making these judgmental uh, forecasts, judgmental predictions, has important domain knowledge and more timely, more up-to-date information about things to come. Judgmental forecasting has its limitations, as one can imagine, uh, but improvements could be attained, I would argue, uh, quite easily by implementing well-structured, systematic, judgmental approaches and uh, the chapter does a great job in summarizing them and we'll talk about them soon and judgmental forecasting is used when either no available data is out there so statistical methods are not applicable we also use judgmental forecasting when the data are available and statistical forecasts are generated but judgment is used to adjust these statistical forecasts and there's a whole section devoted to that in this chapter and then in those situations when data are available both statistical and judgmental forecasts are generated and then statistical and judgmental forecasts are combined so these are treated as three distinct cases in research so um after that brief overview, uh, the first section of the chapter starts with very wise comments about the limitations and being aware of them. The first comment, of course, is that all judgmental adjustments will be subjective to some extent. So when we use statistical models, statistical tools to generate forecasts, those are objective. Everybody who uses those models will arrive at same forecast through the models, through the statistical techniques. In subjective judgment, in judgmental adjustments, we are reliant on the subjectivity of the forecasters, subjective information on the forecasters, which may basically imply that there could be inconsistencies in these judgmental adjustments. Primarily because you may have lots of psychological factors. So you can talk about optimism in forecasts, you can talk about pessimism in forecasts, you can talk about personal agendas playing an important role. 
as well as the political agendas and the organizational politics that goes into it. And add to all that, there's typically a confusion between targets and forecasts in organizations and decision makers. Um, forecasts should not be taken as targets. Targets should not be imposed as forecasts. And the book does a great job talking about that. Um, furthermore, anchoring which is forecast converging to a familiar reference point uh, presumes a, a great role in judgmental forecast. So those are the main things that we really have to be aware of. Given those potential limitations of judgmental forecast, what are some of the key principles that we should pay specific attention to? These are recommended as key principles to reduce the negative adverse effects of the limitations that judgmental forecasts could carry. One is setting the forecasting task very clearly and concisely. So there should be clarity in the task definition, which means avoiding any vague, ambiguous expressions, avoiding any emotive terms, avoiding irrelevant and distracting information. So, very clear test definitions. Second key principle is implementing a systematic approach, which may include things like checklists. So what are the basic information types, uh, timelines, etc., that are relevant to the forecasting task? Which information is important and how, it, how that information is to be weighted? A systematic approach that takes these into account would go a long way to reduce the negative, potential negative effects of these limitations of judgmental forecast. Another very important point, and we know this from psychological studies as well, is to make sure that you document the assumptions and the decision rules that go into the forecasting process. We need those for repeatability, for consistency, and for accountability of the forecasters. Another key principle is to make sure that forecasts are systematically evaluated, which means keeping records of the forecasts and providing feedback on those forecasts. And finally, and this uh, is a point that the authors keep coming back to in later sections because it's tremendously important with huge uh, organizational repercussions, is to make sure that you segregate the forecasters from the users. Just like you should distinguish forecasts from targets that are imposed by management state, you should segregate those who are producing the forecast from those who are using them. So a forecast may be delivering reality check to users and communication is the key. So, Users may have certain targets in mind, may have certain organizational constraints in mind and so on, and forecaster may play the role of delivering reality checks to them. The communication where the forecaster explains the process, justifies the assumptions, plays a huge role in getting users to buy into the forecast and not necessarily adjusting them as we will see later on. So in this section, uh, the authors give a great example with the pharmaceutical benefit scheme in the Australian government. Uh, there are four categories and this particular scheme uses 84 groups of medicines, produces forecasts of medicine volume and total expenditure for each of the four categories. And the forecasting process aids in setting government budgets. So it's very, very important, the implication of it. The forecasting process, once again, involves judgmental forecasts for new listings of medicines and for estimating impact of the new policies. Uh, one of the authors of this book has been involved in this process and uh, examined, made assessments of the various stages in the process and came up with the recommendations. For one thing, there needs to be a more systematic and structured forecasting approach, given the financial amount and policy implications that are involved. They need to develop guidelines for forecasting new policy impacts, which 
again, has huge repercussions for the government and it, uh, the system itself. The forecast methodology has to be documented, including all the assumptions that are made. And at least two people from different areas of the organization are to make the new policy forecast to avoid some of the um, common issues that are encountered in the scheme that produce limitations. And a final recommendation was to basically have a review committee that included the forecasters, those who are responsible for generating the forecast, plus others to conduct basically a review of the forecast one year after the implementation of each new policy so that that feedback could get in, could be uh, brought into the process to uh, improve it in the stages to come. In the later sections, we see different um, methods of bringing judgments into the forecasting process. The Delphi or the Delphi uh, is pronounced in two different ways, I think, depending on whether you live in US or UK, um, is one of those very important points. The key assumption is that forecasts from a group are generally more accurate than those from individuals. So you'd like to extract the information that's in a group. An aim is to construct consensus forecasts from a group of experts in a structured iterative manner. And the Delphi process in general is managed by a facilitator. Various stages in this process. The first one is you start by assembling a panel of experts. Second stage is you distribute the forecasting tasks to experts. Then the experts return initial forecasts plus their justifications, which are compiled by the facilitator, summarized as feedback and sent back to the experts. Then the experts review their forecasts in light of the feedback, and you repeat these steps until a satisfactory level of consensus is reached. The facilitator then aggregates the expert's forecast to arrive at final forecasts. That is the Delphi in a nutshell. What are some of the challenges that exist in this process? Well, the first set of challenges have to do with the experts, the identification of the experts and the anonymity of the experts. For Delphi process to work um, in the fashion that you would intend for it to work, you have to identify five to 20 experts with heterogeneous or diverse expertise. So if all of them have the same expertise, you're not benefiting from the information pool. Um, the participating experts remain anonymous. This anonymity brings its own challenges, but it definitely has its benefits. Um, all the experts have equal say, and all are accountable for their forecast. So there's perfect accountability for their forecast, and everybody's in the same level, same playing field. So there's no undue influence based on personality or seniority, and there are no biases that you can see in group settings. Furthermore, it's a flexible and cost-effective process. So you don't have to try to bring everybody into the same place at the same time and so on. Setting the forecasting task brings its own challenges, in addition to the challenges in identifying the experts and keeping the anonymity. Um, it is in, in setting the forecasting task, it's very useful to conduct a preliminary round of information gathering from experts prior to setting the forecasting task. There could be all kinds of bits of information that you may glean from this initial round that would benefit the actual clarification of the forecasting task. Furthermore, the facilitator may also identify information that's not shared between all experts. How? From the justifications that are given by the experts. So the justifications, mostly qualitative justifications given by the experts is a key. Feedback is another very important 
dimension. Typically, summary statistics or forecasts and the outlines of qualitative justifications are given as feedback. But remember, facilitator controls this feedback. So facilitator may play this crucial role of directing attention and information from the experts to the areas where attention is most required. Iteration, you may say, okay, how many iterations will this take? Because we said it's an iterative process. We know that the process ends when there's satisfactory consensus is reached, but that does not mean complete convergence of all the forecasts from all the experts. It just means that the variability of the responses has been reduced to a satisfactory uh, and acceptable level, if you will. Typically, two to three rounds are sufficient, and that is due to numerous reasons. One of them is that experts are likely to drop out as number of iterations increases. People get bored with giving their feedback again, giving, uh, receiving the feedback, giving forecasts, receiving the feedback, giving forecasts, and so on. So the final forecast after the iterations are over is usually constructed by giving equal weight to all the experts' forecasts. The challenge here is that you have to be aware of the extreme values that can distort the final forecast. And as facilitator, one uh, may take certain actions about maybe trimming those extreme values. What are some of the limitations and variations of Bell 5? For one thing, it's time consuming, and the panel may lose interest if it takes too long. In group settings, these personal interactions can lead to quicker, Clarifications of qualitative justifications. And remember, a lot of the information, the specific information that experts may have is captured in those qualitative justifications. So a variation of this method, what's called the estimate talk estimate method, could be used in some situations, depending on the context, of course, where experts can interact between iterations, so they can discuss their qualitative justifications, but their forecast submissions still remain anonymous. One last comment about the Delphi is that facilitator plays an immensely critical role. The facilitator is the person who's responsible for the design and administration of Delphi process, including feedback provision and generating the final forecast. So the choice of the facilitator is extremely critical. We next move to forecasting by analogies. This involves thinking and discussing analogous products and situations, another form of judgmental, judgmental forecasting. The main challenge, as one can um, expect, is identifying what constitutes an, an analogous product, what constitutes an analogous situation, and why. The main insight that the authors give here is to try to base forecasts on multiple analogies. Don't just stick with a single analogy. Try to find multiple analogies and multiple attributes and try to do the matching that way. And use a systematic approach. So you can use detailed scoring mechanisms to rank the attributes, to record the ranking process, and so on. Um, a version of this analogies is the structured analogy that Green and Armstrong uh, have researched into. They assembled a panel of experts with experience in analogous situations, after which these experts are given the tasks, experts identify and describe as many analogies as they can. So it's the multiple analogies idea again, generate forecasts based on each of the analogies and then expert list similarities and differences of each analogy to the target situation. They rate the similarity of each analogy to the target situation. And then the facilitator computes the forecast using a predefined rule. Could be a weighted average uh, where the weights are guided by the ranking scores of each analogy by the experts, for example, or it could be different set of rules. Whatever the um, setting that you use to come up with analogies and to actually use them for, for forecasting. 
the anonymity of experts could be an advantage, but could hinder collaboration as well. So the finding, the main finding with their research is that experts with multiple analogies and with direct experience with the analogies generated um, have the most accurate forecast. So it's having multiple analogies and choosing the experts with direct experience with those analogous situations. Those are the ones that generated the most accurate forecasts. Our next section in, um, explores scenario forecasting, which is a fundamentally different approach than the approaches we talked about before. The aim is to generate forecasts based on plausible scenarios, where scenarios are generated by considering all the possible factors, the so-called drivers, the relative impacts of those drivers and interactions among the drivers. The scenario approach allows a wide range of possible forecasts to be generated and the extremes to be identified even. And this helps with, of course, uh, early contingency planning. Typically, in some situations, although there are uh, different variations of this. Typically, in scenario forecasting, we ask for best case, worst case, and maybe a baseline or a middle scenario. But there could be all kinds of variations, as I said. Decision makers often participate in the generation of scenarios, and this may lead to biases on one hand, but it can also ease the communication of the scenario based forecast and can lead to a better understanding of the forecast. So scenario forecasting, again, one of the most critical approaches and uh, not as much researched as other approaches um, to judgmental forecasting in a nutshell for us. What about new product forecasting? Let's start by defining what a new product, that's what the, the chapter does. It says it could be an entirely new product that's just been launched, could be a variation of an existing product, a new and improved version, or it could be a change in the pricing scheme, a change in some kind of fundamental structure of an existing product, or an existing product that is entering a new market with totally new conditions. In these situations, judgmental forecasting is usually the only available method because you don't have historical data or you don't have relevant historical data. For example, if it's a new market, you don't have any data in that market at all. So the data you may have in other markets is not directly relevant. In these situations where you have this kind of new product situation, you could use the Delphi or the scenario forecasting or forecasting by analogy methods that were discussed in the previous sections. Or you could use what are used by practitioners quite a, with quite a high frequency, the Salesforce composite executive opinion or customer intentions. So let's look at those in detail. A Salesforce composite is where the salespeople forecast demand for their particular outlet, for their store, for their branch, and so on as they are the people who are actually selling it there. So the forecasts are then aggregated. That's the main idea. But when you have the salespeople generating the forecast, that violates the key principle that the authors talk about, the key principle of segregating forecasters and users. There could be all kinds of self-serving biases, for example, salespeople may generate low forecasts so that when they make higher sales, you know, that's a very positive thing. Or it could be an optimism bias. They may expect to generate high forecasts, uh, look at it optimistically, and then some unexpected event occurs and things don't happen. Plus, salespeople may not be well-informed forecasters or, and or they may have no or limited training in forecasting and salespeople will encounter customer displeasure in store. So if no products left in the store, they are the ones in the front line battling the customers and the 
you know, the, the establishing the goodwill or losing trust, et cetera, et cetera. So they may gauge the forecast accordingly. They may make judge certain adjustments that you may not want. The second um, technique that's used in these new product situations is the executive opinion. So here, instead of the salespeople, you have the staff at top management generating the forecast. Typically, these are generated in group meetings with the executives from different functional areas, and they're contributing information from their own domain, from their own area. It's very important in these situations to justify and document the forecasting process, and we need executives to be held accountable to reduce the biases due to group settings. Finally, the customer intentions as uh, one of the most widely used methods uh, by practitioners involves setting up structured questionnaires that you give to your customers on their purchasing intentions. So then you use those questionnaire results to make forecasts. As you can imagine, the survey design is extremely important. So the way you ask questions is very important. And it's also, there's also a lot of research in marketing about intention versus, versus the behavior. So you may have purchase intentions, which may or may not translate to purchasing behavior. So there are different uh, words of caution regarding each one of these um, approaches as well. Now, what about judgmental adjustments? So far, we talked about judge methods of judgmental forecasting. The main setting in judgmental adjustments is when historical data are available and statistical forecasts are generated. Once those statistical forecasts are generated, judgment is used to adjust for those factors that are not accounted for, that are not captured in the model, things like promotions, things like recent events, things like information on competitor products, etc. There's a whole a body of research that talks about judgmental adjustments potentially being liable to biases and limitations. So the words of wisdom uh, by the authors here is to use the adjustments sparingly. Um, and being aware that the practitioners or users of these forecasts may adjust forecasts just to create a feeling of ownership or credibility, just to have that feeling that they have contributed to and complemented the actual forecast, and to include their intuition, basically. Another word of caution is not to adjust, to correct just a systematic pattern that you think may have been missed by the statistical model. So people have a way of reading pattern into noise. So to make corrections for systematic patterns that you may perceive and others may not, and to judgmental, make judgmental adjustments to correct for that uh, typically leads to reduced accuracy. And finally, one should only adjust, the authors say, when you have important extra information that's not captured into model. You know it's not incorporated into the model and you have important extra information, then you should use them. And in general, you should avoid making small adjustments, especially in the positive direction. Their studies have shown that they typically hinder the accuracy rather than benefiting the accuracy. Overall, in judgmental adjustments, you should be applying a structured approach. So you should be documenting and justifying the adjustments. Um, where these adjustments, remember, are typically implemented by panels. Maybe a Delphi setting could work well. But in whatever case, applying a very structured approach where you document the adjustments, talk about the justifications for them, talk about the different information uh, that you think is not captured by the statistical model and that you may think you have to make these adjustments is important. And they give an example of the Tourism Forecasting Committee. Um, the authors have studied model-based statistical forecasts that are generated by the forecasting unit within 
um, Tourism Australia, there are two rounds of adjustments. In round one, the technical committee, which is composed of senior researchers, economists, independent advisors, makes judgmental adjustments, and these are made by consensus. In round two, um, you have the industry and government experts again making final adjustments by consensus. So examining uh, the forecast through the years, the main finding was that the forecasts were optimistic. What were the learning points that the authors emphasized? Again, the confusion between targets and forecasts. Target could be an optimistic target. And if you think that's the forecast, then you end up with optimistic forecasts, um, which may not realize basically. There may not be enough segregation of forecasters and users, which may cloud the judgments here. Uh, could there be improvements in the iterative process? Is another learning point through there. Again, improvements in the adjustment process that are used in the meetings and whether group meetings are promoting optimism in this situation. Some further reading, um, they, the authors uh, make reference to uh, some important books. And I know that the authors are working in a new edition. I'm sure they will be expanding these lists of books uh, because judgmental forecasting is a, is a very much a growing field. Um, and they uh, refer to some excellent survey papers looking at the importance of judgment and what can, be, what can go wrong, what can be improved and so on. And then they make particular references to recommended papers on Delphi adjustments, analogy scenarios, customer intentions, and so on. And I believe I am finished uh, before with two minutes ago. Um, I was trying not to overrun to make sure that I leave space for questions. Thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Dilik. Um, just look at the Slack to see if there is any question here. I don't see any question here. Is there any question from, um, from Neil, Hisham, or Hussein? And if not, I have many questions myself. <laughs> Almost always welcome. Love questions, Bahman. Fantastic. Well, if there is any question, let me know. I will start probably. And then if there is any question, please, Daniel, Hisham, and Hussein, feel free to jump in. So my, my first question is about the conditions where we, uh, we recommend using judgmental forecasting. So you mentioned data availability is one one thing if we don't have data we go for judgmental uh, my question is are there any other conditions i'm thinking about maybe uh uncer uncertainty or forecastability of a certain type of i don't know time series or products or uh, anything any any sort of variable i'm thinking about the horizon maybe if we we think about next 10 years or next five years so I was wondering what are the other conditions we may look at? Definitely, and I have to go beyond the chapter to talk about the research that's in this area, if that's yeah. all right. I think that's okay. the purpose really, yeah. Just to... Okay, excellent, because the presentation is totally uh, geared towards the chapter. Uh, but if I could talk about other things that are yeah. happening in the research world, that's great. Um, you've touched upon a very important point. I think it's, um, it's a common misunderstanding to think that judgment is only used when there's no data or when there is limited data. Uh, because all the studies, different surveys that have been done in many different countries for a long, long time uh, with practitioners tell us that, well, forecasters use judgmental adjustments. So the forecasters themselves look at the forecasts that are generated by the models and then tweak them. Uh, and they can do that, as Paul Goodwin uh, has indicated in his uh, great books and articles and so on through the years, and my research has established the same thing, is they do that to get a sense of ownership of the forecast. So they always have a justification in that they believe they have more information than what's captured in the model 
So they add those. Um, plus, it gives them, I mean, if they're just going to take the forecast and use it and publish it, what's their role in it? Just choosing the model itself, of course, is a judgment and so on, but that doesn't seem to be satisfactory to the forecasters themselves. So the forecasters, and there's a whole list of other uh, factors as well, other reasons, they make adjustments, but then the users make adjustments as well. Now, they do this for a whole host of factors. Like you said, forecast horizon is one. Uncertainties to capture that whole range of uncertainties that can take place is another factor. I mean, we, we keep talking about COVID because it's the, you know, it's, uh, it's very um, available. It's all in our minds in the forefront all the time. Uh, so we may be anchoring on it a bit much, but it was a, a very high impact and a very unexpected event that happened. Now, you may think about different um, scenarios that can evolve in the future, and these could be you know, more within the next six months, or it could be within the next year, it could be within the next 10 years, 20 years, and so on. Thinking about how much data you have becomes almost irrelevant because when you have a new situation like this, all that data is not really usable. You have to come up with different insights, new models, et cetera, that adapt to that, what you have as a structural break, basically, to adapt to that uncertainty explosion. And that's where judgment is extremely important and beneficial, I would argue. Okay, fantastic. That's great. Um, okay, I have a list of questions here, so I just go through them. Uh, so another question that comes to my mind in, uh, in judgmental forecasting, and then you mentioned and one of the recommendations in the book was to have a sort of systematic approach. Um, and that brings me to talk about reproducibility. I'm wondering how reproducible is judgmental forecasting in general? I think that's an excellent point. Um, there are different issues there. Uh, one is the, if you think about the, the, the consistency of forecasts over time, over different occasions, given the same background information, that's important. And that is maybe one part of reproducibility. So if I have a particular information set, and if I'm coming with this, judgmental forecast for person X who has the same information set, could that person come up with the same forecast? Given that our information sets are identical, would we be able to come up with the same information? Or now I make a judgmental forecast. Tomorrow, I have the same information. Nothing has changed in, in the environment. Nothing has changed in my information set. Would I again be able to come up with the same forecast? Now that brings us to uh, the well to different cognitive and motivational uh, things that could be occurring in the outside, in the external environment that we may always not be aware of. So these could be things that we just do just because, I don't know, there are different relevant situations that we were involved with that may have carry over the desirability bias or the optimism bias or the tunnel vision or whatever it is. It may affect our overconfidence, so that could be reflected in the forecast, etc. So reproducibility is a very, very important issue, definitely for judgmental forecasts. I would argue that you have to have a particular set of conditions around forecasts set up, just like the book argues. Given that those kinds of conditions, given that particular structure, framework is fixed, an expert who gives you judgmental forecasts today would give you the identical forecast tomorrow if there's no change in the information set. So it's all about the forecasting architecture from my perspective. If you set the architecture correctly, 
keeping the same tasks, same constraints, etc. And if you are asking for experts, not just you know anybody from the street about forecasts given their ben the benefit of their expertise, then they should be reproducible. And we see that. We see examples of that with real experts. Now, when you um, look into non-experts, it could be a bit different, of course. And if this forecasting architecture changes as well, if the, the, the structure changes uh, from today to tomorrow or, you know, uh from one person to another then you may lose that reproducibility does that that's fantastic yeah, that's, right? that's great yeah and that, actually that brings me to another question which you mentioned about expert and non-expert so in in the at least in the research side of judgmental forecasting we have many uh many let's say research or paper published uh based on um judgments of non-experts but uh, let's say an example is students. So you use a crowd of students, uh, you know, you show them a time series and uh, you, you make a judgment based on that. And then I'm just wondering how reliable it is because, uh, you know, using non-experts to, to talk about uh, an issue and then uh, use that to, I mean, to generate insights. Um, so what do you think about that in general, using some sort of non-experts to talk about something that, that must, I know that what is the challenge. The challenge is getting those experts is extremely difficult. And then we, we cannot wait uh, five years, you know, to do a proper study. We, you may just want to publish something in two years time and then students are the best thing. But yeah, I'm just wondering in terms of reliability. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, again, a uh, phenomenally important point. And it's not just about publication. I mean, I, I have, done a lot of work uh, with Paul Goodwin, with Sinan Gönül, and with Sherry Debates, and so on. Um, but it's not about publication. The work that we're doing, we're trying to understand some of those core elements in the forecasting architecture and how we can support those judgmental adjustments. Because um, at least I'll just talk for myself. I'm a true believer in the importance of judgmental forecasts and i think they really have an important role to play and uh, that should be incorporated into um, the overall uh, management the forecasting management process as a very as playing an impactful role and so we do devote quite a bit of time to statistical models and their generation and so on but when you talk to practitioners judgment is a reality. So I see my role as trying to find the core components of that judgment, judgmental process that could hinder accuracy and supporting them basically so that the accuracy could be at the best that it could be. So um, coming back to the experts, of course, there's all these studies about non-experts doing performing better than experts as well. Uh, in certain situations, given that the experts may be prone to their um, different biases that come from their field of interest. But it depends on the task that you give. So, for example, if we're talking about stock prices and you remove the names of the stocks and just give time series to different people, then you are taking that uh, domain specific context out of the picture that the studies with non-experts, in addition to um, the availability problem with experts and so on, I think are extremely important in giving us insights into the different components, once again, of that forecasting architecture we can improve so that the, the, when you're extracting, when you're eliciting judgmental adjustments in actual world, let's say, in the domains, in the organizations, you can uh, support them to the best extent possible. And with lots of studies, again, with single um, participants, groups of forecasters, this, that, using real experts and non-experts as well, 
I, I believe that there is a role for both of those studies. Of course, if you can get the experts and have their dedicated time, of course that should be done. But sometimes they are much more prone to the biases about leaving the model forecast aside, for example, whereas the students, you can sort of um, have the acceptability, if you will, of those forecasts and, uh, and you can start study those a lot better with a group that's much more open to that. But then talking about all that, Bahman, I think is a, an important point is about rolling forecasts, about revisions of forecasts as well. I think I was going to address that in your reproducibility question as well. When we have forecasts, we should not think about them as something we shouldn't think about a forecasting process as a process that just starts at point A, ends at point B, you issue a forecast and it's over. That's not the situation in real life. Something else happens and you have to revise the forecast and something else happens, you have to revise it again. It's those revisions and the revision processing and what happens at the end and how you can improve with that feedback. I think the whole thing needs to be studied and making basically experimental work with non-experts is extremely helpful in this regard because as you said if you're going to study that with experts you don't have 10 years to learn from you know what's going on with the rolling forecast and what happens at the end there is a place for that of course that should that work should continue but if you want to learn a bit quicker about the different ways you can help make it better, make the forecasting architecture better than students or any other uh, group of non-experts or semi-experts play a critical role, I believe. Uh, yeah. Raman, maybe I have a question, please. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, first, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, my question is maybe related to the last question of, uh, of Bahman. Uh, in fact, I am wondering in the Delphi method, what, what's the nature of forecasts provided by experts? I mean by that, do they use statistical methods to generate their forecasts or their forecasts are purely judgmental? I don't know if this concept exists. I was wondering how do experts generate their forecasts and uh, because if they use only statistical methods, it, the Delphi method will be like a combining forecasting method. So, yeah, how do yeah, that, how, a, uh, this forecast generate? Thank you. That's a, a very good point. Uh, again, when you have experts who are just um, trying to choose among different methods and you're combining them, uh, that's extremely important. And that's what we do in like Makrodakis competitions. Uh, as well, when you have different experts or group of experts choosing, deciding on which uh, method, statistical method would be appropriate for what kinds of series and then combining them and so on. That's a, a different combination question. Typically in Delphi, you bring people or experts anonymously, uh, you choose a selected group of experts with different expertise on different areas and different domains and you ask the well the forecasting task you structure and you ask them for their judgmental forecast along with their justifications so there could be variations of course depending on the context where you could be giving the same data set to all the experts and having them look into different models, generate those, and then judgmentally adjust them. There could be all kinds of variations, but at the very, um, I guess, primary level, you're talking about the experts bringing their own opinions and justifications for those opinions, which are expressed as forecasts as well. And then the facilitator collects all that and then provides feedback to the uh, a group-wise feedback to, uh, along with the justifications uh, to the whole group and these could be forecasts on anything 
it could be you could be talking about forecasts on when the third wave will hit UK, for example, of COVID. Or you could be talking about when uh, the vaccine, well, we now know that we have a vaccination, but before when the vaccination came, this could be about the time frames expected for uh, a vaccination that could be employed through the world and so on. Could be on anything. Uh, okay. Thank you, thank you. In fact, I come from a supply chain management background, so I was wondering how do they, how do experts, yeah, what's the nature of their forecast? But thank you, your answer is... That's, that's excellent, uh, because in, within supply chains, I, I do work on collaborative forecasting within supply chains as well, and that's, that's, what, that's part of what's being done as well uh, within a supply chain framework and uh, again it could be depending on the context it could be a combination of having past demand data for example or different um, uh, stock out data it could be all kinds of data that they ha that you have that you can give to the experts and have them make a uh, forecast with it or it could be just demand forecast based on certain promotions let's say and you can get that kind of individual uh, forecast along with the justifications, which is tremendously important in a collaborative forecasting among the supply chain partners. Thank you. That's a um, very, very uh, relevant point for supply chain management. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Isham. Uh, maybe my last question is, uh, is related to, to uncertainty again. So probably one of the the applications I have seen in, in practice uh, of the judgmental forecasting in practice is for more long-term forecasting. And of course, when it comes to long-term forecasting, we are dealing with a huge amount of uncertainty. Um, and so I, I, was, I have seen some work of Paul Goodwin at the, in, in, in prediction intervals thing, I, but I'm not, I'm not aware of really this area very well. So I, I was wondering whether we we can have the probabilistic forecast in judgmental forecasting as we have in statistical forecasting. Oh yes, definitely, Bahman. I, uh, one of well, I have several earlier papers that look at probabilistic forecasting within a stock price setting as well, and exchange rate forecasts as well. Uh, definitely, because you need something else other than the port point forecast capture the uncertainty, don't you? To make sure that you do have the, the whole range. And there could be, you could look at it in terms of different elicitation techniques and different ways of capturing the uncertainty and the confidence, if you will, of the forecaster. But especially when you're looking at long term and with all kinds of uncertainty that is coming up, a very structured technique or different variations of a structured technique involve scenarios, which is my, um, my favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, topics within judgmental forecasting. So within you, by using scenarios, you could elicit the uncertainty surrounding um, the, the point forecast as well. Uh, and different um, dimensions of uncertainty and how the different uh, plausible futures could unfold and how you could capture um, the different um, spectrum, if you will, of uh, expectations about the future and whether they're realistic expectations or not. Of course, in the long term, you just don't know at this point, but that's the beauty of scenario forecast, uh, using scenarios in forecasting. You can look at a huge uh, spectrum of plausible futures, including wildcard futures. And that's a tremendously important point. So that's great. So uh, if I understood correctly, uh, one recommendation would be to capture uncertainty in judgmental forecasting with to look at the scenario forecasting. Is it yep. correct? Okay. Yeah, that is definitely correct, yes. Fantastic. Okay, sorry, w w one more question when it comes to forecasting by analogies. Um, how, how, do you, how do you select those analogies and how important uh, is to have them from the same, the same domain? For example, let's say if I, I, I want to use forecasting by analogies in, in healthcare, 
should I just you know, find the analogies in this sector or can I have them in, let's say, a financial domain or, or something like that? It's, of course, it's a very um, difficult uh, prescription to give to say in any setting you could do this. But in selecting analogies, one of the key recommendations would be don't go into this tunnel vision thing. Try to keep your flexibility open. So that's why just selecting one or two analogies is typically not sufficient because you get bogged down in details. And if you're uh, doing the health scare thing and you're trying to find comparable analogies to COVID, you only look at SARS, for example, then that's not good enough. You should look at Spanish flu. You should look at this, that, etc. But you should also look at these kinds of very unexpected, highly impactful black swan kind of events in other sectors to learn about how that kind of uncertainty was profiled, how it was captured into the models or judgment and so on, so that you can use that knowledge, you can transfer that uh, particular expertise to your setting as well. So in using analogies, I always start by looking at what's similar, more similar, and typically, you know, with, the, with all kinds of biases we have, we think about, for example, in COVID, we think about other health-related things, just because that's a health thing, you know, that's the first thing that comes to mind. But then you have to stretch the bounds to get into other domains, which I think is extremely important in capturing the essence of, you know, the, the expertise that's accumulated in other domains and just, you know, transferring them to the current situation at hand. Um, lots of similar situations. And I would also look at situations that are totally op opposite of what they're doing as well. So it's not just the analogous situations, but it's the counter analogous situations. I think that offer lots of insights. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I think um, the time is over as well. Uh, that was really, really helpful. Delik, thank you very much for your time. And I think I will uh, just stop the recording here.